no one is great at something until they've done it a lot and build confidence. Like, no one right off the bat is going to be incredible. And I just think that a lot of us and, and a lot of women um, don't realize how many things they can do in this life. And they're comparing themselves to people's Instagram pages or someone's following. Queen, queen. Queen, oh my goodness. I know I say this a lot, I, but I promise you, I promise you, who you're gonna meet in today's episode is going to be so fulfilling, enriching. It's one of our longer episode. It's our first ever episode with a male friend of mine, Mike Bayer. And if you don't know Coach Mike, he's a two-time New York Times bestselling author. He's the founder of Leading Mental Health Treatments in Los Angeles. He is Coach Mike on the Dr. Phil Show. He has been the coach behind the scenes to every A-list celebrity from Demi Lovato to J-Lo to so, so many others. And he's really spent the last 15 years creating personal development approaches and mental wellness treatment models that combine creativity and artistic expression and just so much heart. He's a dear friend. I've known him for a long time now, and it was my great pleasure and honor to have him on the Divine Loving Podcast today. So give him a warm welcome and enjoy this episode. Mike Bayer on the Divine Living Podcast. Uh, this is such a treat, such an honor to have you. You are the first male guest on the Divine Living Podcast. Welcome, Mike. Ooh, I'm feeling divine. I'm feeling divine. Speaking of feeling divine, I just got to let people know how we met because I think it's kind of a super divinely inspired story, also. And then yes. we get into the the wisdom that you have to impart on, on us all. Um, so ladies, Glenn books us, as in me and him, a trip to Miami. This was how many years? It was this five, six years ago, maybe? Yeah. yeah. Whatever. And um, I'm used to whatever. Glenn books us our, our, our tickets. And normally in business class, if you book two tickets, you're like sitting next to each other and it's that and whatever. And I go and I get on the plane and all of a sudden... Glenn ushers me to the effing middle seat. I'm like, what is happening? I'm like, I, I don't mind if I sound like a diva right now, but I was like, I don't, what, I am not like, what am I doing sitting in business class in the middle seat? Who has a middle seat in business class? Well, they, uh, the universe had given us an international plane to fly domestically from LA to Miami. So Miss Bad Attitude, Bad Mood, like goes and sits down and I see there's the, there's already a dude in the other seat and then Glenn's in the other seat. And so there I am in the middle. And how did we get to talking? What? Do you remember? Yeah, I mean, and, and, and then I probably was like, oh, the seat's occupied. Oh, it's a <laughs> couple. There's a couple coming over and sitting next to me and the guy, they got a lot of bags. They got a lot of garments going on over there. <laughs> so the only thing I remember next is that first, I don't talk to people in cabs. I don't talk to people in planes and you and I spoke, we did not stop talking for five hours. Yeah. <laughs> I learned so much. Ian. I learned so much from you at the time. I didn't even know that there was a coaching world. Like I was, you know, not in the coaching world or personal development. And you were kind of the first person that I had met that talked to me about, you know, that you were a therapist and then you transitioned your career and what you were really passionate about and the types of people you love to help. And uh, and we just got into dialogue. So I'll say, I mean, Mike says he didn't know about the coach. He was like coaching Demi Lovato. He was coaching J-Lo at the time. So we all know I flipped out over that. Um, so what, why don't you talk about your work, what you were doing then, Mike? Well, I think we're always evolving in life. And mm -hmm. I found myself working with a lot of female um, artists, entertainers, executives. Um, it could help that I'm gay, probably does, so that, you know, there's, there's a lot of these women are beautiful. 
And uh, uh, I kept looking over and was getting worried and was like, what's going on? So <laughs> Yeah. But I, I spent a lot of years uh, doing different types of work. So I started off doing crises and interventions and then helping people, you know, when the bands would break up or, um, you know, I was a counselor and then people always go like, how did you end up working with like superstars? And um, I think I just like kept pushing myself to get better at my craft. And then um, over time, I, I also live in Los Angeles and I think um, just one person would refer another person to me. And so I spent many years traveling uh, on music tours, studio sets. Um, I would say a lot, about half the work was crises. Um, and then the other half was like somebody being more in their art, being more authentic, like, okay, I accomplished everything I thought I would accomplish. What's next for me? What's my purpose? And so I love working with creative energies and types. It's a lot of fun. And um, I found that I started to be, I guess, pretty good at it because people kept calling, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so, all right, this group loves all things manifestation. So let's, I just want to like back up the bus here a little bit because you're being really humble and, you know, okay, you have a desire to help people, clearly. You mm -hmm. have a skill set, clearly. I'll even give it that you live in Los Angeles. Okay. But there's a lot of really good meaning, talented therapists mm. in Los Angeles that haven't manifested and would probably love to manifest working on tours and with superstars and all of that. So mm. what do you think was is different about you and how have you manifested these opportunities and experiences? Well, I did manifest. I did sit there and, and say, and a colleague reminded me of this. I totally forgot that I like sat back and was like, you know, who do I want to work with and what do I want uh, my life to look like? And I did spend some time and energy um, kind of trying to create uh, an experience of the type of clients I wanted to work with and the type of people. I didn't really know what it was. It's funny, I go on, a, I got a call yesterday from Kelly Osborne, um, and I'm going on her podcast on Monday. And she texted me and says, Mike, can you please come on the podcast and talk to me about relapse prevention? I was like, sure. And I didn't realize she'd just come out publicly in the last few days with that she relapsed. And then, and then she's like, and then can we talk about the intervention you did on me? And I, I'd forgotten a little bit, like, that that's where our relationship started and how difficult she was. And she was probably, that family was one of the first families that I worked with. That was maybe like, I don't know, 12 years ago or something. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I think, <laughs> I, I don't know why or how necessarily like I manifested certain types of people to work with, except that, I have a certain way of being that I think also is maybe attractive. And I also have a bit of bluntness and um, I don't have like a quiet desperation to be really beloved by um, celebrities. Um, and I think that in that world, it's rare. Like there aren't a lot of people that have worked like you'll I've noticed in the coaching world, there's a lot of people going, I've worked with A-list celebrities and this and that. And I'm like, I've never heard these people. And I would know some of these coaches. And then I went in the coaching world, everyone worked with celebrities. And by the way, it doesn't even mean that much because whatever, like it's just, it's just someone who was talented and got a lot of admiration and awesome, inspiring people. But, you know, like, I think that, I haven't felt desperate for someone to be my client. Mm -hmm. And I also am okay if I'm not working with them. And that's the mindset that I've kept. And I think when you help people and people start to realize you can deal with really challenging personalities and it's still fun. And that, you know, a lot of people maybe I assume would get brought in and maybe they would be really impressed by 
you know, being on set or like a celebrity walking in the room where with me, I'm just like, are we done yet? Like, I just have a different vibe to me. And I think my vibe works with some people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, I do love that you started with universal principles, that you did take responsibility for imagining. Yes. Like, how do you want to design your life? And so I think there's a, a real power and a real authority. I think that's something I've always noticed that you've carried with yourself, that you have a not an authority over others, but you have a real personal authority that seems very clear to you. And the other thing, and I don't know if this is true because I have made this up about you. So I'm glad I have the opportunity to ask you. Yeah. The other thing that I think is interesting about you is that you don't block out your success. Block out? Like, I, because I work with so many women, like women can imagine and do the vision boards and meditate on the thing that they want. And they're like, uh, they're afraid to receive and they block out what it is they actually want to receive. So they block out their success. And I've just, I've watched the way you carry yourself and you seem to have a much more open filter. Like you don't play the games of like, who am I? And I could never, and I'm afraid of that you just no, have- like honestly and i think we all have to say this like i know i'm a bad bitch i know <laughs> i am and if you survived something really challenging in your life and you've gotten to the other side of it you're a bad bitch too and like either you dig into that and let that be in your existence or you feel ashamed of it. and like mm-hmm. it's like owning Like if you've been through and everyone's been through really tough stuff. And sometimes we have to remind ourselves like, like I'm resilient or whatever it is. You know, I always think it's interesting. Like people will get so much admiration for like, let's say different people. And I'm just like, we're all like, once you realize, once you really realize, and I think this was probably helpful for me working in with a lot of entertainers and realizing like, I don't want what they have or like the world, like it's just kind of a different, some of them amazing human beings. Don't get me wrong. Like, like I just left a lunch and I ran into, um, I was getting together with this guy, Hank and Hank and I have known each other for years. He's the general manager of rock nation, but Hank used to work for me. And then we ran into like Joe Jonas and Sophie Turner and I went to their wedding in France and I hadn't seen them in like over a year. And like, But like, I say this because it it doesn't matter. Like, it doesn't matter if it's a wedding in like Long Beach. It's just that the thing is people people underestimate who they are and they compare. When you really are able to stop comparing, you don't give an F. And we all compare at different times. And sometimes we compare because maybe we want to make ourselves feel bad. Let's say sometimes we can compare because we're like, oh, I'm not good enough, right? That's a defeating comparison. And sometimes we want to compare so we can go like, how do I measure up? But like, no one is great at something until they've done it a lot and build confidence. Like, no one right off the bat is going to be incredible. And I just think that a lot of us and a lot of women um, don't realize how many things they can do in this life. And they're comparing themselves to people's Instagram pages or someone's following, you know, and like, as long as you stay true and surround yourself with the people that like, know you and vibe with you and lift you up like you're set and you feel yourself Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know I love it it's just it's it's bringing it all back to humanity that we're all awesome and would we just see it acknowledge it live it shine it and 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 let the universe do its dance because there's no lack of opportunity for everyone for everyone. Yeah. Absolutely. I love what you're saying about the comparing because people will do that. You know, they'll they'll come to to me about speaking or whatever, like how do I speak like you? It's like, 
Well, once you've done something for over 25,000 hours, like I had hoped that you have a little bit of an ability to be able to <laughs> ad lib, you know, right. it's like, um, and I think that's the thing that there's so many people starting new things, you know, which is amazing. Starting new businesses, starting new endeavors, starting new creative ventures. And then you go and look at someone's Instagram and you're like, but I don't have a million followers. Or I could never sing like that. Or, and it's like, no, just focus on getting good at it. And the opportunities will, will come. There's, there's no lack of them. Yeah, so, absolutely. And you are a great speaker. Oh, well, thank you. I wasn't fishing there. Um, Let's move on to one of your one of your current awesome projects. So you've uh, been coaching these A listers, and now you are coaching on Dr. Phil. How did that come about? Yes, I know it's kind of a trip. So I, I used to throw this charity event on music tours. It was called Cast on Tour, and essentially it was like a self improvement speaking event that was a give back for fans. And so in every arena, you know, you'd have 500 to 1,000 fans showing up. I'd bring in a guest speaker. Some were famous, some weren't, some were inspiring. And I did this in about 75 cities around the country. Wow. And yeah, it was really cool. And in every city, there was a different speaker. And uh, in the Los Angeles city, uh, Dr. Phil spoke. And so when he came to the event, and spoke, I was like, oh, wow, he's really cool. And then he, I don't know, we like connected. And the interesting thing is, so in theory, I could have spoken every city, like if I wanted to. It was like, I was the CEO of the charity. Like I could have totally lifted up my brand and like made it about me. I think I spoke in two cities. Wow, Mike. Because I literally was like, I don't want to be known. And like, I don't care. And like, I'm not very good at speaking. And I'm not like, I don't want to do that. And even I was the host, like meaning I would just introduce someone. And even me introducing someone for 15 seconds, I would have anxiety over it, right? It gives you more respect for Ryan Seacrest, huh? Oh my God. And, and everyone who does this stuff, right? And so I never thought... I would ever do television. I never had a vision of doing television. What wow. happened for me is two months prior, I started going to Iraq and I went to refugee camps there and I was going to open up a mental health clinic there. And I went back twice. And the last time I went back alone for Yazidi women, I was like, okay, I've worked with these celebrities for years, but like, I want to be in the trenches. I miss being in the trenches. I miss getting creative solutions. And then, you know, Kurdistan, Iraq, it's like, it's a journey. It's an adventure. So, you know, it's tragic when husbands beheaded. I mean, it's wild. And so when I got back from the trip, I was all fired up. And I thought that I was going to get everyone really on board with this idea of uh, rallying behind my efforts in Kurdistan, Iraq. And I couldn't get anyone involved. And all the publicists were like, no, nah, that place is a little too, like, polarizing. and you know, why don't we do something here in the States? And so I had this moment where I was like, why don't I become the brand? Why don't I become the brand to go do cool things? Fast forward, I just manifested, hey, I want to be the brand. And then I met Dr. Phil, still didn't realize that it was coming from like this manifestation of I want to become mm -hmm. the brand. He asked me to go on an episode. And uh, here we are 40 episodes later that I've been on. And yeah, and first uh, regular in 19 years. And um, he's been an incredible mentor of mine. I, he he told me to write a book. He flew me with himself to Dallas to meet my book agent and uh, became a New York Times bestseller and the next book did. And so it's like, I don't know, it's been really cool. And I've learned, again, that like, we typically don't love something when we don't believe we're good at it. It's not like, like you can love golf, even if though you suck at golf, but the reality is there's no stakes, right? Like mm -hmm. when there's stakes, there's insecurity, right? Mm -hmm. And that's where I started to do television and I had resting bitch face. Like the first time I saw myself back, <laughs> I was just like, what is wrong with you? You look miserable, Mike. 
you know, and then you get better. Like, you know, you, you've done this a long time, Gina, you know, it's like, I look like I'm going to murder someone when I'm speaking on stage. So literally the cameraman has to have this sign that says smile above it. Cause like, I'll be talking about a serious subject, but I look like I'm going to kill someone. So I, I feel the pain. Yeah. So that's it. That's it. That's how I met him. And I said, yes. And Beautiful, beautiful. Well, I love both of your books. So let's share with everyone who might not have picked it up. What, what, tell them about your first book. Yeah. So my first book is called Best Self. And uh, in the book, it's all about creating your best self. My best self. Oh, let me derobe my clothing right now. But like my best self is a wizard named Merlin and he's an avatar. Right. And so I have wizards all over my house. And I actually have like a wizard on my shoulder. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's like my eye kind of. So For like if you're in the listening book, on the podcast app, you can run over to YouTube and, and check out the visuals here. Yes, go to Gina's YouTube. So that like the best self is all about defining and figuring out your best self and like getting creative. And this is what I did for a bunch of years was helping talent figure out who they are authentically. It's kind of a framework for figuring out like, who am I and how do I tap into this part of me? Like with you, it's like queen, you know, it's like, what does it mean to be a queen? And what does that look like for you? And every queen is a little bit different, but they certainly have certain char- characteristics about how they hold their own, right? <laughs> That's a version of a best self. Your best self is, I'm assuming, a queen. Mm-hmm. Um, and and it's whatever authentically a queen means for you. And, and for the people who follow you and love you, they're all queens and women are queens. Mm-hmm. And so that's what we get in the best self. And then the last book, One Decision, is all about how we're all just one decision away from like making whatever change we want in our life. And so I help people really simplify, look at blind spots, the boogeyman in their life and get into like, all right, let's make the decision today. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so it's just been playing with concepts and, you know, you, you know, as an author, when you write a book, you know, I've never given birth. I don't know how some of these authors pump out books. Cause I'm like, Oof, every time I do one. <laughs> when I wrote my book and realized that people got to buy it for 20 seven dollars <laughs> i was so insulted i'm like why are people buying my coaching programs for a hundred thousand dollars but this was way harder to write this 27 dollars yeah book. and it could be on sale for like 18 bucks right <laughs> it is well i guess that just means that both of us aren't really real authors or we're not writers so i guess we're authors or yeah um, or like it's it, you know but part of it with writing a book that i don't think a lot of people realize is the process like you can love to write but you also have to write thinking about how am i touching the audience how do i make sure i keep them on this journey how do i get them not to check out how do i get it's like you have to really put a lot of uh effort into it because if it was just about writing Mm -hmm. for the sake of fun and writing it's i almost think that like fiction is easier to write do you just make stuff up? <laughs> no one thinks if you're on a spot, like you don't have to figure out an acronym when you're writing fiction. <laughs> oh, funny, funny. So um, what drives you now? Well, uh, drives for what? Like for life or? Yeah, any of it. Like, like what, like, What are you really drawn towards these days, like post pandemic? I mean, we've all rethought our lives. We're all like, what are we doing? What actually matters? Like, what are you either lit up about or what drives you now? Yeah, well, I'm, as you can see in my background, I love art. Um, So I surround myself with art. I'm driven, like, kind of to create conversation and some of the work that I do around, like, how you can get along with others, even if they disapprove of you or your lifestyle. I think that could be kind of fun. I used to have to spend a lot of energy, like, because I, I could get villainized when I was working in entertainment because uh, people would be worried about their percentages getting marked down or that, like... What do like, you mean? 
Well, because like I'm when you're working with talent and talent is young and you start to help them understand like, oh, I don't need to have a business manager on a percentage basis or I don't need an attorney on a percentage basis or like I don't need four security guards. You know, like when you're suggesting different things as you're depending on the client and what you're working with, like people may not like you. And so I had to learn at different times, like how to still like myself when people weren't very nice because in entertainment, it's uh, you walk into a lot of rooms where um, you feel a vibe, you know, and you got to just get over that vibe and feel yourself. And so it drives me to figure out like how to help people get along with people that have polarizing views. Um, I'm also driven. I create like a new series about try something new. I try something new every week. Like I made one decision to try something new. So like this Sunday, I'm doing a hip hop dance class, but every week, I You've something. never done a hip hop dance class, Mike? No. Stop it. I haven't. Michael. I haven't. I follow I, you on TikTok. I have such a hard time believing that. No hip hop. Not like a yeah. I'm doing it with like seven professional fighters. That's the funny thing. They're all from Brazil. <laughs> and uh we're gonna do it in the studio this Sunday. And then like I've done ballet for the first time. Cool. Like I'm doing things that like I don't know, as we get older, it's like, why haven't we tried certain things that we may fall in love with? Like, I, I fall in love with jiu-jitsu. I do it three to four days a week. Wow. And it's all from trying something new and to realize, like, wow, I, like, I really love this. Like, it's an amazing workout. I like the people. I like the culture. I can do it anywhere in the world. So what drives you? Interesting. Well, I'm going to say, I'm going to, I'll answer that in just a second. You know, um, a friend of mine and a coach and a mentor, she's also an astrologer. Her name is Jen Rassiope. In, in internet marketing, we used to talk about content is king. Mm. And as the pandemic came in and everything was shifting up, she came in and spoke to one of my groups in uh, the fall of 2020. And she said, we're, as we're moving into the Aquarian age, she said, creativity is king. Mm. And it's like, we can see people like us where it's like, you know, we've had the very good fortune of working in very meaningful ways and business and personal development and, and all that stuff. And it's, um, I can definitely share with you, like the creative pulse for me is stronger than it ever has been. But uh, let me say, what drives me? I don't know that I would call, I don't know that the core of it is creativity yet. I think the core is really full expression. And I, that might sound a little cliche, but I think where I'm coming from, and you and I had a, a brief conversation recently um, where I've gone slightly more public that um, my professional life, as I know it, is coming to an end. Uh, by the end of June, I'll no longer be a, a business coach and have really come into a place of surrender with that and I think that I thought when I was on stage or hosting dinners in front of the pyramids or hosting retreats on yachts in Mykonos, like I felt like I was so full expression, like I did my JLo version of personal development and, and all the things. And as this era is coming to a close, like I, it feels like as big as that felt that it, it was actually almost only this much of me actually. And so like, I think I'm craving, I'm driven. I'm like, like obsessed with discovering, like what's the bigger part? Like, like what's the even fuller expression? Cause like, it's, it's a little surprising. Cause I thought I was fairly there um, when it was just a drop in the bucket. So um I've been what, was, what was the moment that for you where you went, oh, well, this is, uh, I mean, was it over a period of time or was there a certain moment that... That this is like, over? Yeah. <laughs> it, <laughs> I shouldn't say this out loud, but I'm going to because I think transparency is important. And I, I have felt, I genuinely, I would not be where I am today. I, every, every client... Every interaction has 
has made me who I am and has been such a gift. And I think there was one coach, one group coaching call and just one more person asked me, Gina, can you help me figure out who my ideal client is? And I just, I got off that call and I said, Glenn, I can't do it anymore. Like I'm just done. And not because it wasn't a great question, not because it wasn't what the person paid for in, in the pro and I answered like, I, you know, I'm not, because I'm coming to an end of an era doesn't mean I'm not giving fully. Um, it just means that I had to have the courage because at that time it didn't feel like there was like a next something. It felt just very much, it was an end. And so I was like, I, like it was too much to admit like, Oh wow, I'm not going to be a business coach because I was like, I didn't, I didn't see the next something yet. Mm. Um, so I think it was just, it was, and it was a feeling of, of done. I think that it, so, you know, when you're in a relationship and you know, it like needs to end for a while and you kind of like brush it off and ignore it. And this was just the last, it wasn't that dramatic. It was just a, that feeling inside. Like, it's like when you, when you spend your last dollar, when it's just, it's done, it's empty now. Uh, that's when I had to really come to terms with what, Com oh. let's complete well. Actually, th that I think is a really important thing too, because I think um, sometimes we wait till things just get awful to leave them, mm -hmm. relationships, businesses, whatever. Um, or or we just like wait till we can't stand it anymore and we're just like, I'm out, you know? And I've seen, I've had team members do that to me. They're just like, I'm out. And I I felt like I really wanted to do justice and like a victory lap of the last 15 years. And so like I, I've given myself these last three or four months to just really like savor it and soak it in. And now even now when people are like, can you help me get clear on my ideal client? I'm like, yes, because I know that it's the beginning of the end. Well, yeah, and that's it's a good, I, I can relate to what you're saying. I, I did interventions for years. Um, and then, you know, even over the weekend, I got a call for an intervention. And I ended up referring the intervention to a colleague of mine. You know, I've, I've owned a treatment center for over 15 years now. Mm. And um, there's been different, and you've had, we've had to go through so many evolutions. It's called cast centers in West Hollywood. And sometimes like I had sober living homes or I was doing interventions or I was doing different things. And I kind of stopped doing interventions about, I don't know, maybe like five years ago, I would say. And without like a clear vision, but I, I was doing a lot of interventions. I mean, it was probably half my income was, was doing interventions at one time in my career. But I reached a point like you where I just felt like, like it was kind of like if I had one more family say, what happens if they say no? Or um, not being able to get a family member on board that the inspiration can go away. You know, I, I, I sometimes am amazed by people who can do the same thing, let's say even coaches who can give the same talk for 20 years right? and act like it's the first time they've said it. But then again, that's what musicians do when they sing. That's what actors have to do at different times with liners. So it's like some people are built and find a lot of comfort in doing the same thing. And some people, you know, they want to shake it up. And it sounds like you're at a, you're driven to shake it up. Mm -hmm. Um, I think this is a perfect time. I pulled a quote actually from Best Self. Um, that I, I just feel like you were just meant to, it was like you were, you were ahead of your time and it was like for this time, I know it did well and all of that, but it was like, it's really like for right now. So let me read it. So you say, the real problem is that people are living lives that are incongruent with their authentic selves either because they're following their family's footsteps instead of carving their own path, or they're doing what worked for them 10 years ago, but simply doesn't anymore. They've closed themselves off to what life has to offer because of fear or any number of other reasons. So when I read this, Mike, I was just like, yes, could we all just please go for the authentic self? And like the part that like just nailed me was like, or the thing that worked 10 years ago. 
<laughs> yeah. Oh my God. You know, this woman told me I'm, I'm a recovering addict and I started working at treatment. There's this woman, Diane Poole, and she, I just really admired Diane. She, she was someone that I just, everything she said, I did to a T, you know, I don't know if you've ever met people like that where like you're in a men and I still get mentored, but like back then I was like, I was a sponge, you know, and I was a good sponge. Mm -hmm. I, and I still, I'm, I think that's why I've had some success in different worlds is I am coachable. Like I know I'm coachable and I love someone to tell me like, here's the way to do it. I'm like, let me try it out. Let me try it out. And she said to me, she goes, Mike, the thing is you either grow or you go. Mm -hmm. And she goes, and some people, they don't want to grow and they'll keep riding it until they go. And it just has stuck with me that like any time where we feel really complacent or what we were doing before just isn't working anymore and we feel confused about what even to do, it's an opportunity to grow and to just, because if we did it in the past, we could do it again. Right. We could do it differently. We have the skill. If anything, we're more wise. We have the skill set. We have connections or if we don't have the skill set we didn't have it back then either we oh. just developed it so why not develop the another one yeah the first intervention i did where it was a big hollywood family and i was living with my mom in orange county and you had to give these this paperwork to with this company called air addiction intervention resource and i had to borrow my dad's suit i had to <laughs> uh go to kinko's because i didn't have a printer to print out the intervention statements and this company, you had to recite everything. Like they had a script. Okay. I'm terrible at scripts and memorizing scripts. And this family, I was 24 years old. This family was a very rich Hollywood family. And they all looked at me like I was crazy. And they called after I left, after I spent two hours, and they won their money back from the CEO of the company. And the CEO oh, gave them. My yeah. gosh. My first intervention. And, you do? and I tried so hard. I mean, I studied, I prepared, I was. Well, those are moments, right? Like those are moments where we either grow or we go. <laughs> and like I said before, when you realize you're a bad bitch, you're going <laughs> to grow. Yes. Yes. It's the truth. And you have to go there and we all have to do it. And we can't be victims and we can't blame that family and we can't blame my suit or my, or my Mercury Sable I was driving, right? <laughs> you got to just grow and we all got to do it. And, yeah. um, you know, I think part of the challenge and, and I think it's also figuring out who do you want to be mentored by? Because I see a lot of coaches since I've entered more into this coaching world <laughs> that will talk about authenticity and like, first of all, their marketing budget is insane. Like they have so much wealth. And then on top of that, like they're buying 80% of their followers. And like, you can't, like, I just think as like someone who's trying to learn and develop, it's just figuring out the right mentorship um, the best you can. Mm -hmm. Because uh, I think that sometimes we go when we feel like we like, well, I, I did this and it didn't work. Well, guess what? Do it again and do it differently and do another course and do another sign up. Like can't just blame it on one time event. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's just, it's being more committed and dedicated to the next level than, you know, it's always awkward before it's elegant. And uh, I think the, the people that end up getting there and are growing, you know, they just shove their ego out the door and fail forward and are willing to suck for, a, you know, un, until you don't. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the thing that I personally am really holding on to, because the, the winds of fear will, will come in, like, well, what if the next chapter isn't as fun, lucrative, fulfilling, fabulous uh, as the last one. And I, um, one of my mentors, Catherine Woodward Thomas, once said, the new life is always better than the old. So mm. as I love that, 
I'm in this. I'm uh, holding on to that deeply. Yeah. That's cool. I love that. The new life is always better than the old. Well, Mike, I know that you are busy. It's always just such a joy to spend time connecting with you, learning from you, hearing from you. Any last words of wisdom that you would like to share with people as they're kind of reevaluating their own lives? I mean, we're all figuring out this thing and um, (laughs) we're all... We're all, no one's like, we can all learn from each other and, and really make attempts. If one thing I've learned is a lot of people will help you for free if you're extremely coachable. And a lot of people believe they're coachable, but they're not. Mm. And to have a mindset, if you ask someone, like I'll get hit up by people all the time asking me to mentor them. Like that's something I'll be like, will you be my mentor? And I'm like, I don't even know if I would want to be this person's, but like, Because it's fun when you're mentoring, when you're on the journey together. But if this isn't being someone's therapist or someone's coach, but if you want someone to be a mentor, like you got to show up as being extremely coachable. And like, I think that's, um, that is the journey. And that's the fun is if you can start to ask people like, Hey, what would you do here? And do it exactly how they said to do it. Try it out. See if it'll work. Get your own beliefs away. You know, be coachable. And I just think um, that's just the words of wisdom I would give that we have to remain coachable at any age, no matter what we do. Um, And yeah. I love it. I love it. And I can already hear the wheels turning from some of the listeners that are like, okay, I know who I want to reach out to. I know who I'd want to mentor me. I know I'm really coachable, but I couldn't possibly bother that person. Well, I think there's a few things you can do. One is putting together like three friends who get on a group call every week. So sometimes it's just within your own vicinity of support because accountability is is huge in other people's insights. So one is just your friends. The other is like, no, if you're reaching out, uh, building relationship and, and is chemistry. Like one of the things Jen taught, Jennifer Lopez taught me that like has run through and through is like, like at the end of the day, chemistry dictates everything, everything. You could put up the two best people that you would think it would be the best collaboration or the best talk or whatever, but their energy and chemistry is going to dictate how great it is. And so sometimes instead of just saying to somebody, hey, will you be my mentor? It could be like, hey, can I ask you a few questions and let it organically evolve. Yeah. And also mentorship doesn't mean that person on Instagram with a million followers. Like the person who started up a business down the street for the coffee shop may be an incredible teammate for for you to learn from because in that process, they're going to have a great accountant they could recommend. They may talk to you about that time someone tried to sue them so you can make sure you get liability insurance. Like it doesn't need to be even someone who's like in your same arena. Mm-hmm. And it, because we all love, everyone loves to help someone else when yes. they if there's an energy. Yes, 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 yes. You know, uh, it's I love so, so much what you're saying. Um, I saw someone like rolled into my DMs and was just like, "Gina, love your book. I'm I'm doing a, a book club with it or whatever." And I didn't know who the person was, and I I don't know if they have three followers and a cat or whatever. But I just like. There was just something about that particular DM. And I was like, want me to show up at the book club? You know, when she was like, "Ah." you know, it's like, it feels good when there's not like a, like a heavy, like save me kind of thing. But like, so that's what I love, love. And this is what I want to wrap with is that I love that you said that, well, hold on So many times we think of mentorship in the coaching world as like this package and there's a weekly session and there's a six month thing and then there's Voxer access and there's this and that and like, you know, dedicating your firstborn to them. I love, like, I feel like you're getting into like the real ancient, like master apprentice form of like, just ask someone two or three questions 
if you're coachable, that might take you four to six months to actually take that advice and implement it. Like somebody has four minutes to put you on a track for four months. Mm -hmm. And, and a lot of people, sometimes it's not your idols. You know, it's it's literally the person who's in your universe. I think the universe creates opportunities. No matter where someone lives, you can talk to a business owner because there's a business on every block. Mm-hmm. You know, like in every city, there's community services. <laughs> like there's there's things that have there's parks, there's activities that happen at the park. And sometimes it's just like the basics and and realizing that like. Go talk, go build, see who you have chemistry with. Mm-hmm. You know, like start to get to know. And then maybe two or three after saying hi at the coffee shop, you're like, hey, can I pick your brain for five minutes? Because I'm thinking of creating a sandwich shop or I'm thinking of selling jewelry. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and you may make a new friend and you may only have a few meetings, but like that wisdom, I believe, is better than signing up and spending a fortune because you're building relationships in your community with people who want you to win because they've coached you. Mm-hmm. So that's, I, I'm a big believer in like, um, sure. We can all shoot for the moon and like all try to connect with Oprah. Right. Like everyone's like, or like Oscar down the street's cool too. Like mm-hmm. it doesn't, doesn't have to be what, your fantasy is. Well, and you know what they say, never beat your idol anyways. Yeah, (laughs) it's true. Oh, Mike, I love you so much. Thank you you for all this time and wisdom. You're just, you're just so rock solid. And uh, it's been an absolute joy as always. You too, Gina. Love it. And I'll see you when I'm out there visiting Miami. Yes. Yes. Bye. Bye for now. Bye. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Hold on. Before we forgot. Before yeah. we, where can everyone, like, I don't oh. even get a hold of you, but where can everybody get a hold of you? Yeah, it's just, it's Coach Mike Bear, Coach Mike B A Y E R, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, Twitter, CoachMikeBear.com. I have a bunch of free empowerment groups. Gina spoke at one. She was badass. We loved it. We meet on every Tuesday. It's free. You just go to my website to join or hit us up on social media. Okay, so we'll have all these links below. Plus, get Mike's books. Your life will be changed. You saw how much wisdom you got out of this segment. So get his books. And lastly, here's what I want from you all. I want you to screenshot this episode and I want you to tag both me and Mike on Instagram and tell us what's the number one nugget that you got from this. We love Instagram. We love your DMs and we love your tagging. We'll probably reshare So screenshot this episode, tag both me and Mike, let us know what you got from this episode and how it was a blessing. And don't be shy. (laughs) Tag us, please. Mike wants your DMs, people. Go follow Mike on Instagram. Screenshot this, DM him, and to be continued. Lots of love. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I told ya. I told ya, didn't you? love him and love the message and love that we are just all in this transitionary time together. So do me a favor, do us a favor, please screenshot this episode and tag us on Instagram. We're not just saying it. We want to hear from you. We want to be connected with you. Make sure you're following Mike on Instagram. Uh, When you tag us, let us know what you got out of this episode. We love hearing your feedback, and if you feel like reaching out and asking either of us a question or just DM us or share with us there, Um, but we love resharing your tags in stories, so let's just keep this conversation alive. Let's stay connected. The reason why I'm asking you to do this is because I really believe thoughts grow stronger as they are shared, and I don't want anyone to feel left out, left behind or isolated, I want you to know we are all in this together. And that includes you, that includes me, that includes Mike. So take advantage of this opportunity and I can't wait to see what your number one takeaway was from this episode.